So I'd firstly like to just welcome you all to uh, our public lecture and panel discussion on Formula One aerodynamics. Uh, my name is Carl Schomburg. I'm the current vice chair of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, University of New South Wales student branch. We'll probably just call that AIAA UNSW from now on. Um, just firstly, it's been great to see the overwhelming response to this event. Um, when we first booked this, we never thought the question was, or the question of, is the Law Theatre big enough would come up, but came up a couple of times over the last few days. So it's great to see you all here tonight. Uh, just to give you a quick intro to AIAA and our branch. Uh, AIAA is the world's leading professional organisation in aeronautics and astronautics. And our student branch uh, was formulated with two main goals in mind. Firstly, to strengthen the professional links uh, between aeronautics and astronautics and UNSW, and also raise the awareness of the importance of academia among undergrad students. Um, oh, actually, on that, AIAA conference is on at the end of the year, so you should all be a part of that, and any final year thesis students should seriously consider presenting their work at that conference. Uh, because, of course, AIAA is much more than just planes and rockets, as our chairman, Matt, will happily reinforce. Uh, that brings us on to tonight's event. Uh, tonight, we're fortunate enough to welcome Dr. Sammy Dissonos, former head of computational fluid dynamics at Caterham F1. Uh, Dr. Dissonos will deliver a presentation on working in Formula One and the transition from university to the Formula One industry. And after this presentation, we'll hold a structured Q&A session uh, with Dr. Dissonos in the panel and joining him will be Dr. Graham Doig and Matthew Cruikshank uh, to discuss current areas of research at UNSW in automotive aerodynamics and also how undergraduates can get placements and graduate jobs in F1. Uh, so without any further ado, let me quickly introduce Dr. Sammy Dissonos. Uh, Dr. Dissonos completed both his aerospace engineering degree and PhD at UNSW. Throughout his edu education, Dr. Dissonos's passion for aerodynamics in motorsport motivated him to take every opportunity to design, develop, test, and race a variety of automobiles. Uh, during this journey, he became the project leader of the UNSW Solar Racing Team, called Strategy at Bathurst 1000, and conducted track data analysis for the team which won the Australian Drivers' Championship over four consecutive seasons. In 2006, Dr. Dissonos achieved his ambition of working for an F1 team after gaining employment as a junior CFD aerodynamicist at Formula, oh, sorry, at Toyota F1 in Cologne, Germany. After a stint at the Williams F1 team and five years after commencing his F1 career, he was appointed the head of CFD development at the Caterham F1 team and eventually also took on the responsibility of being the wind tunnel special projects group leader with a, uh, with a desire to commence applying his aerodynamic skills to a greater variety of problems, Dr. Dissonos has recently decided to move back to Sydney to take on a role in academia, and he's the current, currently a lecturer on um, uh, mechanical engineering at Macquarie University. Wow, that's a long bio. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sammy Dissonos. Thank you for the introduction. Okay, we're good to go. Can everyone hear me all right? Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. Let me just begin by asking you, who here likes Jensen Button? Does anybody here like Jensen Button? Yeah, there's a few of you. You guys must be doing it pretty tough this year, eh? <laughs> um, from this picture, it doesn't look like Jensen's doing it too tough. He's doing all right, I think. <laughs> I think Jensen's got a pretty good job, actually. He gets to drive some of the most amazing cars that mankind has produced every second weekend. And that is pretty awesome, I reckon. So what is so fantastic about these Formula One cars that, that we all love so much and we watch TV and so many thousands and millions of people do so uh, all around the world I've decided to take some onboard footage to try and highlight what some of those fascinating uh, facts about these cars are. So I've chosen my favourite circuit, which is Spa in Belgium, because it is one of the fastest circuits with one of the highest cornering speeds. I've cut, I've cut the, sh the lap short because it goes for quite a long time. 
So I'll just pause it here. We're going through now the corner called Earl Rouge. Earl Rouge is one of the most fierce corners in Formula One. It has a massive compression, vertical compression as you go through this corner. And that puts a massive load on the spine of the drivers. It, it that can actually hurt them if the car is not set up properly. As he's pulling out this corner, he's going up a hill which is about 45 degrees in angle. And I know because I've walked it and I've run out of breath by the time I got to the top of that hill. But for a Formula One car, it's no effort whatsoever. So now he's going along one of the longest straights on the circuit. And watch his top speed as he's applying full throttle with his reaching speeds of 320 kilometers per hour. Now, that personally, I don't think is a very impressive thing about a Formula 1 car. What's impressive is how quickly he breaks into these corners and then accelerates through them. He just turns left, right, left, right. And just watch the speed that he's going at as he's doing that. This is one of the slower corners, but some pretty impressive corners are coming up now. So 170 kilometers per hour through this corner. This next corner is 300 kilometers an hour. Watch this. So what effect does that have on the driver? That has a quite a big effect actually. It means the driver has a huge lateral loading put on it. Four Gs in under braking, four Gs in cornering. What does four Gs mean? Four Gs means that a human head, which weighs about six kilos plus the helmet of two kilos, in total, when the driver is going through those corners and braking like that, he's trying to support the weight of 20 kilos on his head. And that's a pretty big load to be trying to sustain. So why is it possible for a Formula One car to do this? Is it because of this amazing engine that can generate 780 horsepower, or six times the amount of a normal Corolla? Is it because of the weight, which is less than half of a normal Corolla? Is it because of the refined suspension, which is rock hard? Is it because of the disc brakes that glow red hot because they reach 900 degrees Celsius during the braking phase? Or is it because of the tyres that are designed to run out of light after just 50 kilometres as opposed to the 25,000 kilometres that you hope the tyres on your road car are going to last for if you don't do too many burnouts? I don't think it's any of those features. They all contribute, but I think the most important feature which makes these cars have the performance that they have is their aerodynamics. And the specific aerodynamic feature is the downforce that they generate. At 170 kilometers an hour, I haven't accidentally put this photo upside down, it's deliberately upside down. At 170 kilometers an hour, a Formula One car can support its own weight if it's driving along the ceiling. At 340 kilometers per hour, which is its top speed, it can support four times its weight in downforce. What does four times its weight mean? It means it could carry a Holden Commodore along with it, if that was a possible thing to do. So, you know, to jump into one of these cars and be a Jensen Button or be a Michael Schumacher or the video I'm about to show you, be Mika Hacker, you have to be pretty crazy and you have to be pretty brave because sometimes you've got to take risks with these cars and these risks sometimes don't pay off, but in this case they do. Clearly you have to be pretty brave to do something like that. Those manoeuvres were being done at 320 kilometres per hour. Personally, I didn't want to get into F1 to be driver. I wanted to be an engineer. And I didn't think I ever would have the pose or the physique to sell natural water to be a racing car driver. So I see fear of things like this. I wanted to be involved in Formula 1 because I felt it was the pinnacle of engineering. I felt that there was a lot of research being conducted here, especially in the 80s and 90s, which was very relevant for road vehicles, especially during that period. What you see in this video is an active suspension car, the FW14, one of the most advanced cars that have ever been built in Formula One. This car also tested other features like 
the uh, variable time in gearboxes, uh, ABS, a lot of these things have now been outlawed because the organisers of Formula One believe that these technologies are too expensive to continue to develop in Formula One. And so unfortunately it's lost some of that research aspect and now it's more about being a sport. But as engineers, it was our job to find alternative technologies, alternative ways to come up with solving the same problems. So how did I get to my life ambition of being a Formula One engineer? Well, it actually started quite early. I started off, I made this decision when I was in high school, and I started by racing model solar cars while I was in high school. And then when it came time to go to university, I had to decide which university did I want to go to. And I chose UNSW, like I guess so many people here have done as well. But what made me choose UNSW? The reason was because there was extracurricular engineering activities that I could take part of. Things that took me out of the classroom and put me into a real life situation. And we had the solar car on the left, which I was heavily involved with, and the Formula SAE, which was not around when I started, but was halfway through uh, my degree. So why did I stick with the solar car? Well, personally, I wanted to become neurodynamicist at that stage. And neurodynamics for a solar car are nothing like a Formula One car. A solar car wants zero downforce and as little drag as possible. Completely the opposite characteristics to what you need for, for a Formula One car. But the, the, the aerodynamics were important and that's why I pursued being involved with a solar car. So this was a great opportunity for me. I got to apply my skills, learn a lot of engineering um, details. For example, I got to learn how to lay out composites at Hawk de Havilland out in Bankstown. And, we did a lot of research. For example, my, under my leadership, the team was the first solar car team to ever produce its own solar cells. And they were the first organisation to be able to laminate a curved solar module. And what does that mean? We could make solar panels in the shape of the car. Nobody else could do that before we started looking at that. We also got to make, do a lot of mechanical systems, you can see here. And in my special role as the project leader, I also got to do a lot of media. So this was a very unique experience that I obtained. When I finished my undergraduate degree, I tried to apply to, to teams in Formula One, but unfortunately I wasn't successful. But I wasn't too concerned about that. I thought that could be a good thing actually, because when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I didn't get a chance to do anything about CFD. CFD was still a very new technology when I was doing my undergraduate degree. CFD is a technique, a computer program, that lets you simulate things on a computer exactly like you would in a tunnel. In fact, it's got lots of advantages over a tunnel. It means you can see the flow, which is something which is very difficult to do in the, tu in the tunnel. You can test something without having to physically make it. That is impossible to do it in a wind tunnel. So what would I investigate? What I decided to investigate was the interaction between the front wheel and the front wheel of an open wheel racing car. And the reason I chose this was because there's a lot of work already being conducted on these individual items. But as you can see from this photo, these items are right next to each other and they were expected to have an interaction. So I drew myself up a wing and a wheel, a very simple one. And I started investigating the problem. But any good CFD engineer should know that it's not right to use a CFD model without doing some sort of validation. And to do some validation or to get some experiments that I could compare my CFD to, I needed to build a wind tunnel. Because at the time, we didn't have a wind tunnel with a moving ground. And I also commissioned this LDA system. So the LDA system are these lasers that you can see in the right hand picture, and they can measure the velocity at a particular point behind the wing and the wheel. So once I was confident that my CFD model was working well, I then began to investigate different parameters associated with the wing and the wheel. And one of the things which I investigated, which turned out to be very, very useful in my later career, was the effect that varying the span across the face of the wheel has. Now this was quite odd, because at the time, in Formula One, you weren't allowed to have a wing which spanned much more than what you put in this bottom photo. But I went ahead and I did a completely overlapping front wing and wheel, like you see in that top photo. 
The other great thing about doing a PhD is it gave me an opportunity to go out into local motor racing teams and help them with their, um, with their racing. I completely volunteered my time, spent weekends, many, many weekends away from home uh, racing these cars, racing in the development V8 series, in the actual V8 series at the Bathurst 1000, and also Formula 4000, which is what you used to race for the Australian Gold Star, the Australian Drivers' Championship. And I took the opportunity with the Formula 4000 guys to design some barge boards for these cars, some devices to help generate more downforce. This was very, very valuable to me because not only did it give me experience, but it gave me contacts. And contacts are very, very important. Using those contacts, I then went overseas and I met a lot of people overseas who could help me in the future get me a job. Jason Somerville, current uh, head aerodynamicist at Williams. Ralph Hardman, he recently got nominated the best aerodynamicist 2012. Marianne Henson, my former boss at Caterham. Ben Agathengalu, who works at Ferrari now, but was at Red Bull at the time. And Willem Towitz, who is probably the most helpful person you'll ever come across in Formula One when you're a beginner trying to get a job. So, following this trip, I stayed in touch with all these people that I met, kept sending them updates. And one day, I got the amazing email. I got the email which said, we have a job opening, would you like to come and do an interview for it? And that came from Toyota. And I did, I did a video interview with Toyota. I was very concerned about it, I think Graham remembers it at the time quite well. And for many weeks after, I heard nothing. And I was very, very disappointed. But sitting in 505 up in mechanical engineering building one night, a second email came, and the second email was, I've been successful and would like you to start. And I was absolutely elated. This was fantastic. I had to go home and tell my family straight away. I don't think my mother was quite as happy about the news as what I was, but I think, I think everyone was happy for me. So we arranged a big uh, going away party for me before I left to go to Cologne. And my family was kind enough to, to get a cake made for me, which was in the shape of a Formula One car. And so that's a, that's a very important memory for me. So there I was now in Cologne, just in time for New Year's Eve. And I have to say, if you ever go to Cologne for New Year's Eve, make sure you take some protection with you because there, everyone is allowed to keep their own fireworks. Everyone's allowed to fire their own fireworks. And I was standing on this bridge celebrating New Year's with the, the gentleman, JP, who was my biggest contact of all, the biggest help for me uh, getting over there to Europe. And I had to protect myself from all these fireworks that were just flying left, right and centre. But I was there for work, not only for fun, and one of the first projects that I got to do for the TF108, which was during my second year with Toyota, was look at the effect that the front wing has due to the steer. So the TF108, the car in um, 2008, had a big problem. The drive used to turn the steering wheel and lose a lot of downforce. And when do you need downforce? You need it in the corners. So this was a big problem that we had to solve. And I looked at the effect that the span has on this characteristic and we found that if we shorten the span of the front wing, we would lose that sensitivity to the steer and then we just had to figure out how to get the performance back as a result of that. We managed to do that and we introduced it. The first race that we introduced it, which was France in 2008, we scored a podium. So I was absolutely thrilled with that result. But the car that I love the most, the TF109, the first car that came into the new regulations. And what was very, very unique with these regulations was they changed the span of the front wing. Now the front wing had to completely overlap the front wheel. How lucky was I? <laughs> so, I was put on the front wing project again, and I was very, very happy about that. And the thing that I focused the most of my time on was on these front wing end plates that you can see right here. And I introduced something unique to F1 that year. I introduced a slotted front wing end plate. So this great big gaping hole that you can see here. What I realised we needed these end plates to do was help direct the flow around the air. But this was very difficult for the end plate to do in the environment that it was working. And it needed assistance. That assistance came from the slot. And that slot helped guide more air around the front wing. I was 
very, very happy to see a lot of other teams adopting that solution to the problem as DG came on. But a lot of the, the, my superiors at Toyota realised that this was a quite a unique solution. So at the team launch, or before the team launch, they said to me, Sam, we want to hide your end plate from everyone else. Can you come up with an end plate which you don't think will work? But just make it look nice. Just make it look nice so that we can make it. We can put on the race car for the launch. And then, hopefully everyone else is going to try and copy that one. And I said, all right, no worries. And I came up with this one here. And that's exactly what happened. We got a lot of media reports saying, look at how nice these end plates are. Aren't they really nice? Aren't they really pretty? But the crazy thing was, these were the real ones on the top, which were waiting for the first test. The other amazing thing was, every time that car would come to the pits, I don't know if you remember, this car also had the double diffuser. So there was two unique things about this car. The double diffuser, which a lot of other teams didn't have, and these sort of front wing end plates. They would hang a curtain at the rear wing and cover the double diffuser, and they would put a great big box on the front wing to hide its front wing end plates. So that's my favourite car. But unfortunately, Toyota closed down after 2009. <laughs> And this is something that, if you want to be involved with this sport, you're going to have to be willing to adapt to. And Jason Somerville, who I told you about before, he was very, very useful, helpful in this situation. Because he found out that I applied to Williams, and he, that's the team he used to work for, and he personally rang them up and put my name forward for them to, to basically help me get the job. So, things went okay at Williams, not very, very well, they went okay. I only was at Williams in the office for actually three months. Um, but in those three months, I introduced this device, the number one in the top left picture, which is the undernose turning vane. That device helps guide the structures from the front wing to the rest of the car and put them in the correct position so the rest of the car can operate correctly. So after three months, I actually decided to go to Caterham, or what the team was then known as Team Lotus, because I got a really, really good offer from them. So what happens then when you decide to go from one team to another in Formula One? Well, what happened to me was they put me in a room by myself for six months away from all the other development. And I basically watched football for the next six months. I didn't do any Formula One work at all. In fact, the most concerning thing about Williams was I actually asked for a month off to be able to come back home before I would start at Caterham. I'm paid. And they agreed to it. But on my last day, they sat me down with a room full of lawyers and they said to me, you are being released to go home to visit your family. If we hear you at Hawking Caterham, we are going to come after you. <laughs> anyway, so that was Williams. <laughs> but before I tell you about Caterham, let me tell you about these two guys. Do you guys know who these two guys are? Yeah. Who's the guy on the left? Yeah, Richard Branson. Who's the guy on the right? Yeah, I'm actually impressed a lot of you people know that. Tony Fernandez, I, I describe to people who don't know him as the Asian Richard Branson. They are very, very similar. I'm sure that when these two get together, and if life was a musical, you would hear in the background, anything you can do, I can do better. They both have an airline, and one day they both woke up and said, how about we start a Formula One team? And so they started a Formula One team, because that's what rich people can do, apparently. Right? <laughs> but not only did they say, let's start a Formula One team, they said, let's make a bet. Whoever's Formula One team finishes ahead in the first season, the other would have to serve as an air steward on that airline. And here they are, getting measured up as the air steward. And by the way, when I say air steward, that meant wax the legs, skirt, make up the lot. It wasn't... A male issue was supposed to be a female issue. Now, <laughs> who do you think won the bet? Cater won the bet. So, um, Tony, Fernand Tony Fernandez won the bet. Richard Branson had to dress up. That's a pretty scary picture, so I shouldn't leave that on pretty too, too much longer. Tony Fernandez won the bet, but Tony Fernandez also wore the drinks on the flight, so that, that joke probably backfired on him, I think. But, me being involved with Caterham. So I told you a little bit about Marianne Hinson before, one of the people that I met. Marianne Hinson was tasked by Mike Gascoigne to put together a list of people that she would like in a department if she was starting up an aer uh, aerodynamics department from scratch. 
And I was lucky enough to be one of the people on her list and in the role of Head of Safety Development. And that is basically how I moved from Williams to Caterham. So that role required me to oversee all the work being done by engineers who use CFD as a development tool. Whoever tried to use CFD to improve the performance of the car, I had to help them with that. But it also put me in a very unique position. For the first time, I was responsible for hiring engineers. I had to go through hundreds of CVs every time we put a job ad out. And that is not a very exciting task, let me assure you. So, hundreds and hundreds of CVs. And what would I see? I was absolutely amazed that so many students who are doing engineering, who want to be doing Formula One, are already doing SAE, and so many of them are also already doing CFD off their own back. I don't know where the CFD programs are coming from. I'm not going to ask any questions. <laughs> but they're doing all this work off their own back just to show their interest, just to show how passionate they are about this work that we will do. So when you get 100 CVs of such passionate people, how do you differentiate between them? And in the end, it had to be a personal recommendation, a master's or a PhD. They were items that we used to use to differentiate between who would we select to work with us. And I'm talking about the team that was coming second and third last consistently. Imagine what it was like for Red Bull, Ferrari and McLaren every time they're looking for a junior CFD engineer or any other junior engineer. So I also got the chance to be the wind tunnel group leader for the special projects. And that meant that we had to work on projects that were for the future. Things are a little bit harder than the standard development, which was a lot of fun. But it also meant that I got an opportunity to interact with the drivers. So here's Heike Kovalainen and Jana Trulli. And like I said before, a driver's got to be really brave. Well, only one of these two drivers was really brave, actually. The other one was just not interested at all. Who do you think was the interested one? It was Heike. Heike was the interested one, Jana was not. I think that's the only photo of him smiling, which is why I used that one. So, Heike Kovalainen, and Jana Trulli and I, and we're talking about a project that we're working on. And I'm saying to, to the drivers, I'm saying, Guys, I think I can get it to work in a simulation, but I don't know if it's going to work on the track. This might react completely differently on the track, and what would you in that job? And I turned around and said to me, you just build it, and I'll test it. I don't care if I crash. And that's the sort of dedication that you need to be from a driver, but it's also the sort of trust that the drivers put in you as engineers. Their lives are in your hands of the car that you built. So, what do F1 engineers do who get so much trust from these drivers? I've worked at three different teams, and the three teams were very different sizes. Toyota, I think everybody knows, is amongst the biggest team that has ever been in Formula One, and they have almost a thousand people working there on one stage. That includes, right, that includes the engine and the chassis, which a lot of other teams don't do. For example, Williams don't do the engine, or Caterham don't do the engine, they get it ready. And that's why those teams are so much smaller. But still, they were a very, very large team for that time. Williams had 450, Caterham had about 350. What do these engineers do all day? Well, what they don't do is watch this cartoon that McLaren puts out every, for every single race. I think McLaren do this to try and distract the rest of the Formula One group, but it must be them that are being distracted by it at the moment. F1 engineers have an abundance of resources to use they have the most modern engineering techniques available to them to build these two cars. One of them being rapid prototyping, a device which just, your part just emerges out of this vat of liquid. You just draw it and you just wait and it just prints. People know it's 3D printing as well. Autoclaves, these are big pressurised ovens that help compress composite sandwiches together, make them as thin and light as possible and as strong as possible. Five axis CNC mills that are so big you can do an engine block with them. I'm not talking about one of them. I'm talking about a room full of 30 or 40 CNC mills constantly running all day, every day, 24 7 to generate the parts that they need to keep two cars running consistently. This mill was so big that you had to use a crane to get the part in and out. An engine and gearbox dyno. <coughs> This was a device that let you drive the engine as if it was in the car, but it was sitting right in front of you in the office. 
and they have used this to solve problems or to reproduce problems that have happened on the track. A driver in the loop simulator, a device where a driver can sit in and drive the car around and the engineers can change parameters on the car without having to build that part or actually make that possible. And the driver can give feedback about what that effect was like. A seven post rig, a device that shakes the car around so that you feel the effects of the bump have on the suspension if the suspension has been optimised. The biggest clusters available at the time, at least when I was there, over 4,000 CPUs running simulations consistently and very complex wind tunnel models and wind tunnels. So what do engineers do? Why do they need all these resources? Well, one of the reasons is every single component that is on a Formula One car probably with the exception of bearings and bolts, are unique to that car. You won't be able to bolt this to any other car on the grid. Things like a monocoque or a carbon fibre view box case. There's no car on the road which needs these items. We specifically make it for that. And not only do we have to analyse and refine all these components, but we have to test them, make sure that they're safe like we do in this crash testing. Make sure that when the driver has an accident, he's not going to be hurt. But sometimes we redesign too much. And what's the consequence of that? Well, um, Toro Rosso gave us a very good example of what the consequence of that is when you design too much. Um, yeah. But my favourite bit is the two wheels are missing and the driver's still trying to steer it. I didn't say they're smart, I just said they're brave. So, you can see there's a lot of resources available to us, and what, how do we use these resources to make the car go faster? Well, I'll give you a bit of an example shortly, but these two cars are actually very, very different. The car on the left is about two seconds slower than the car on the right, but they are still a Caterham, still a 2012 model, but the left one is slower than the right one, and why is that? It's because through the season, we continuously evolve all the components on the car to try and make the cars faster, especially the aerodynamics. The aerodynamics is the thing that gets the most attention. And if you remember our friend Tony, Tony is told if the car goes fast, the aerodynamics are good. If the car goes slow, the aerodynamics are bad. And that's what he remembers. So Tony is happy. Tony is happy when there's a special graph in every aerodynamics department which has a target line on it, a line which Tony and the managers of the aerodynamics department have negotiated before the start of the year and said this is what the target is. At the end of the year, we want you to be past this target or at least on it. When the development curve, which is shown by this green line here, with all the possible changes that we've done in the time to improve the car's performance, is above that red line, Tony is happy. When the line dips below the curve, Tony is mad. Now, um, Actually, Tony is mad is not a good situation because Tony mad means Tony wants to fire someone. And um, that's actually happened. So I told you Mary Ann Hinsel, the person that set up the aerodynamics department, she got fired because she, Tony was not happy with the aerodynamic performance of the car. So this is a real situation that if you get into motorsport and if you progress to the sort of level where you are in charge of the department or in charge of a lot of people, you have to be prepared to face the wrath of very, very rich people who have very, very little patience. So, how do we develop your dynamics to prevent Tony from being mad? We have three specific domains to be able to do that in. The first is simulation. So CFT that I've already told you about is an example of a simulation. The next is scale wind tunnel experiments, which you've seen a picture for already. And the third is the full scale experiment, or the actual race car itself. Historically, the progress has been very sequential. Someone will come up with an idea, it will be tested in a simulation like you can see in the far left picture. Using the simulation as a filter, we'll then decide which ideas to progress to the wind tunnel. The wind tunnel will tell us which ideas work and then we'll build the right ones for the race car. So to be able to do this, you need a department of people. A department which is mostly wind tunnel focused at the moment. 
So up at the top, you have the head of aerodynamics, so where Marianne used to sit. Next is the deputy head of aerodynamics, and then underneath them, you have a lot of heads of departments. So I used to sit in this grey box over here, the head of CT development. And what we used to do was, myself and the head of wind tunnel development, we used to guide the four development groups for the wind tunnel and the CFD and help them with the path that they would take to develop the car. Now, I guess you would like to know where you could enter this piece of paper on, or this structure on. In each of these development groups, and in some of these regions as well, there are junior engineers. And there is quite a few of them actually. Um, out of the 60 staff, I would estimate about 20 are probably junior engineers, so engineers who, have, who have, this is their first job in industry or in Formula One. But the green box has actually made something. The green box has made the people that are required to work in the wind tunnel. The grey boxes are simulations and the yellow ones are the guys who work on the full-scale car. The aerodynamics department itself doesn't do much work on the full-scale car. We only monitor the performance of the full-scale car and make sure that the parts that we designed are put onto the car appropriately. But you can see from this picture that you need a lot more people to run a wind tunnel than what you do to run CFD, which is one of the advantages that simulations have. So I'll tell you a little bit about a wind tunnel. A wind tunnel needs a wind tunnel model, an exact scale of the full-size car. So this is a 50% model that used to get used at Toyota. They actually moved to 60 before I left. And hmm. Wind tunnel models are actually almost as complicated as the car itself. They are a little car. They are held by a C in the middle, and they move up and down, they move left and right, and they can steer the wheels. And we need to measure the car in lots of different situations so that we can understand not only how the aerodynamics work in one position, but in lots of different positions. But simulations have other strengths. Simulations have the ability to be able to let you visualise the flow, like I said before. And these two pictures are actually two pictures that I used to give out at an interview. And I used to say, from these two pictures, can you suggest to me what you will change? And the, the secret is, where it's blue, you have to do something. Where it's red, you're happy. So, this is a slice of the front wheel, this is the front brake plug, that's the vortex, vortex, you're happy with. But if that's separation or turbulent region, you're not very happy to want to clean that up. The same with the rear for the engine for a double diffuser. So, I mentioned also before that in Formula One, we're always trying to push the envelope. And one of the envelopes that we have to work within is the regulations. You might have heard, for those who follow Formula One, I assume most of you do tonight, that one last year, one of the most contentious issues was deformable front wings. And this is where simulations are very, very important. Simulations can let you do something else that you can't do in the wind tunnel. You can model a deformed shape of the front wing in a simulation, but you can't do that in the wind tunnel very easily. So, sometimes though, some teams get it wrong. And when they get it wrong, the wing bounces around, it hits them on the ground, and these pictures get broadcast all over the world, and one of the person that sees them is in charge of the rules, and he comes up to me and says, your front wing is, uh, is not legal and you have to change it for the next race. So as simulations progress, and they've come a long, long way in the last 10 years, they are taking more and more importance in the development for Formula 1 aerodynamics. Now, people have the confidence to be able to go straight from a simulation to a full-scale experiment, and that's because they appreciate there are things that we can't model in a wind tunnel that we can model in a simulation. So I'll give you an example of how we would go about an aerodynamic development. One of the other very interesting aspects of Formula 1 recently has been the Coander exhaust, which was an idea that came from the blown diffusers. So they're doing the exact same thing, it's just in 2012 they imposed a new regulation which said you can't put the exhaust now near the wheel, you have to put it up high and far away. That should stop you from using the exhaust to make downforce in the diffuser. But clearly, that all the guys who work in the teams are, are more clever than the guys who set the regulations. So the, the thing that the blown diffuser, the command exhaust does, is it tries to get the plume into this region behind 
the rear wheel to try and generate a strong vortex and to try and generate downforce at the rear of the car. So for us to be able to model this in the wind tunnel, we had to make some modifications. One of the modifications we had to make was by some very, very large compressed tanks. So tanks that can hold compressed air in them. And to charge them, we need a lot of large compressors. These, these compressors and tanks had to be con connected to the model using a series of pipes, which didn't affect the balance. But not only do we have to make modifications to the wind tunnel, we also have to make modifications to the race car. So the race car had to change the exhaust, had to change the engine map. We had to devise an engine map with Renault's help that when the drive was on throttle, there was still gas being pumped through the exhaust because that was helping generate downforce. We had to use simulations to understand where the exhaust plume was going because where the exhaust plume goes, it's hot, as you can see from the Mercedes picture here. So where that fire is gives you a good example of where the exhaust plume was going. And then we had to use the simulator to see if the driver could use this very strange engine map that we've introduced to the car. Could he actually drive what we were giving him? And eventually, when it was actually put on the car, we had to take measurements to understand, is the exhaust plume going where we think it is? So eventually, yes, the Coanda exhaust made it on the Caterham, and we found that it has a lot of downforce. You'll probably want to know how much downforce. I'm going to say 45 points and see if you get worried. The um, 45 points is about six months of standard Formula One development. But we had to get this on the car in the space of two to three months. And this was meant that everybody there had to work very, very hard to make that happen. And this is, brings me to some of the challenges that you're going to face if you get to work in Formula One day, not in Formula One one day. Formula One is very challenging from a personal perspective and a professional perspective. It's challenging from a, from a personal perspective because it is only in Europe. It is only in two or three countries. It's in three countries, actually. England, Switzerland, and Italy. And eight of those teams are all in England. So first of all, you have to like living in England like Graham doesn't. <laughs> it means that you have to be prepared to not live in a single location. If you get a call one day from Salva, for a promotion while you're living in England, it means you have to be ready to pack up your stuff and go to Switzerland. And that's something that you have to consider. If I want to be involved with this sport, as amazing as it is, am I willing to do that? You also find it very difficult, or at least I do, to find the appropriate work-life balance, particularly when you love your job so much and there's not much else there. When your family is far, what are you going to do on the weekends? There's plenty of other things to do if you're willing to travel, but sometimes you just get sucked in by this job and the pressure that the job puts on you. And a few professional challenges. So I've already told you look, we've got job security. Particularly at smaller teams, there's always this fear that the team is going to close, that the team doesn't have enough money to continue. Don't remember, this, this isn't a money-making organisation. This is an organisation which just races two cars for a marketing reason. And as long as the marketing reason makes sense, then the team will continue. But a lot of times, it's not clear where the money is coming from to do it. The other thing that you have to be prepared for is the motivation for research is not always governed by brilliant ideas. Sometimes it's governed by what the team next door is doing. If the team next door is doing something, and your technical director sees that, who's going to say, I want that, please? And you have to drop what you're doing, and you have to try and make that work on your car, even though there's a good chance it won't straight away. And because of the constant pressures that you will have in Formula One, research is never focused on understanding problems. Research is focused on solving problems. And that's a very different thing. Because as long, once you've overcome, once you've got that part on the car, you've done your job. And then you go on to the next thing. It doesn't matter if you don't know how you did it or if you just got lucky, that's enough. So, Obviously, Formula One has to have this, has some positives and negatives, and I absolutely love my time there. But more recently, that, those negatives started to outweigh the positives for me. 
And that's why I decided to return home to Sydney, close to my family and friends, and take on a lecturing role at Macquarie University as in mechanical engineering. And now I'm setting up my own research department and I'm looking for PhD students and companies to collaborate with. It's a beautiful campus, that's the, that's the library there and that's the domain <laughs> area. If you want, just come around, I'll show you around. <laughs> so what, what are the things that I would like to research? Well, I'm still passionate about Formula One. Actually, putting this presentation together for me was really, really difficult. I was watching so many videos online and thinking to myself, why did I stop, man? That was awesome. But anyway, I got through the presentation here, I'm delivering it tonight. One of the reasons that, one of the things I would like to do is focus on the things that in Formula One they don't have time to do. So one of the things that I don't have time to do is generate adequate data for validation, collate enough experimental results that they can use to set up simulations. And one place where I think that will be important in the future is the coupling of FEA and CFD together. So the bending front wings that you saw um, Ferrari have trouble with, that's the sort of experiment that I would like to do in the future. One project that has already started actually, and James, James is a one of our PhD students here at UNSW, which I'm supervising as well. He is looking at the cornering effects, how the aerodynamics going through a corner of an object vary relative to uh, when they're going through straight line or in yaw, which is how they're currently being tested in the wind tunnel at Formula One teams. And through the work that James has been doing, we've come up to realise that actually this sort of problem is not just for Formula One cars. This problem exists for aerobatic aircraft, and it also exists for submarines. And one thing that I didn't know before James started his PhD was that submarines can actually turn within four times of their radius, which meant that they have this problem as well. Their dynamics, the fluid dynamics over these bodies changes because of the cornering state that they're in. And then there's a pet project of mine, which I've already got funding for to start at Macquarie University, which is an F duct or a passive F duct. So, I think most of you know in 2010 the passive F duct was introduced and what it required was a driver to cover this hole that was in the cockpit to store the rear wing, to make the rear wing produce less drag. Now, um, I know this might be a bit controversial being in an aerospace society, that storing the rear wing is actually going to produce less drag, but I'm more than happy to explain that to anyone who wants to discuss it later. <laughs> and this got banned again in Formula One, but being an engineer, we have to find another way to do it without has been banned. So what's been specifically banned in Formula One with this is that the driver can't be the person that activates or the driver can't induce the change. So that's why it's got to be a passive device, a device that happens by itself, solely dependent on the speed of the vehicle. But there's also a lot of tangents that the technology that we've been developing in Formula 1 or that we've been using in Formula 1 can also be used elsewhere. And this is some CFD that's been done of brain aneurysms. And this is work that's actually underway at Macquarie University at the moment. A brain aneurysm is a little bulge in a vein which is at risk of bursting. And if this bursts, it could be quite consequential for the, for the patient. The patient could die. And what is being CFD and FEA is being used now, the exact same software that is being used to, de to develop those flexible front wings that you saw bouncing around the Ferrari was to decide whether or not a patient should be operated on or not. And then there's also other tangible sports like cycling and swimming which can also benefit from aerodynamic analysis. And of course we shouldn't forget renewable energies. Renewable energies is actually a quite big, in, well, I wouldn't say quite big industry, but it is, there is an industry for it here in Australia. There's a lot of work being done on wave energy and air energy, and this is, a, is one region where I believe there's a lot of crossover from Formula One. So, in conclusion, I can reiterate that Formula One is a very, very exciting and unique sport. And the thing that I want you all to leave here believing is that it's completely accessible from Formula One, from Australia. You can do it from UNSW, you can do it from Macquarie University or any other university that you might be at here in Australia. But there are things you're going to need. And those things are going to be contacts. Contacts are critical. Contacts that can give you contacts into F1 teams. That is probably the single most important thing that you need to be able to have a career in Formula One starting from Australia. But 
the thing you must appreciate is that contacts are only willing to assist you when you can demonstrate to them that you are making every effort possible to prepare yourself for such a role. And so you have to impress the contact so that the contact will pass on your name to the next person. And how can you do that? You can do that through extracurricular projects, through master's projects and through PhDs. And obviously that, I believe, is an excellent preparation for, um, for your suitability for, for the Formula One industry. So, I've mentioned that I also have some NEPA PhD students in the future. There is my contact details. I believe um, we're going to have some questions now. I'd like to thank you very much for your time and have an answer to your questions now.